ipmnation.com. Ah, living in a city when you're in it, watch the people walk by. And if you listen real close, you can hear them talk about their lives. And some hate it, some love it, some of the thoughts, some are just tired. These are the people in the neighborhood, they just trying to make it out right. Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Dr. John Rich, and you've tuned in to another episode of Dr. John's Neighborhood. I'm delighted to have you with me here once again. I'm really excited because I have uh, somebody on the line who's uh, an expert researcher out there at my wife's old alma mater, Indiana University. We're going to be talking a little bit about the importance of getting good sleep when you're a parent. Uh, before we start talking, I'll alert you once again to go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or my website, and you can find places to order my newly released book called Positive Parenting. And Positive Parenting is a good bit of what we're going to discuss uh, with the interview right now. So I have on the line with me Maureen McQuillan, she is from Indiana University, soon to be Dr. McQuillan, right? Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm graduating in May, mm -hmm. um, and I'll be defending my dissertation in May. Uh -huh. And then next year, I'll be doing my clinical internship, which is a requirement for the PhD. And the article that, I, uh, that got me to find you is an article that just got released on the Journal of Family Psychology, called Maternal Stress, Sleep, and Parenting, and you're first author with uh, John Bates. He's a professor at IU, is that correct? Yes, he is. He's, he's been here for quite a while. I'm his last graduate student. Oh, is that right? He's going to retire? Yeah, he's, he's not retiring yet, but um, kind of moving in that direction. So oh. next year, he'll have a postdoctoral researcher working for him. Uh -huh. And then soon after that, I believe he'll be retiring. Well, that's fantastic. Great, great. Well, um, so we talked a little bit about the show, and I was recounting to you a little bit of my own experiences as a father. My sons are 13 and 15 right now. Mm -hmm. um, actually 14 and 15, the one just turned 14. But I remember going back to the time when my wife first brought the babies home. And then even at times during those toddler years, how difficult it was to get consistent sleep. And this is one of the things that you talk about in this article. I was, uh, as somebody who's tries to be reflective. I remember asking people who were parents or had been parents back in the day, you know, what's some parenting advice that you might offer? And I remember somebody saying that one of the best things that a parent can do to be a good parent is to make sure that they're as well rested as possible because it gives you the ability to be calm in situations where you might blow up if you were overly tired. And that seems like it resonates with the, in, at least the intent of the study that you've done. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. Um, I'm very interested in parenting and individual differences in parenting. So why are some parents more responsive and others are, are less responsive? And why might you be responsive on one day and less responsive on another day? And that sort of led me to different factors that could contribute to those differences, one of those factors being sleep. And I definitely agree with that advice that you heard, that one of the best things you can do is to be well-rested. That mm -hmm. helps you parent more effectively. Okay. And so why is that so important? I mean, I, it, I think it seems obvious to most people, but let's be explicit about the differences between the same parent, let's do a little within subject design, yep. where you have a parent who got a good night's sleep and a parent who hasn't slept well for the last two weeks. Yeah. So 
Um, what you're asking this question about why, why would sleep affect parenting is an excellent question. And this paper that came out doesn't totally address that exact question, but it's a good question to ask. And our hypothesis about why sleep would affect parenting is likely that it's affecting your emotion regulation and your cognitive regulation. So how well you're able to practice self-control, essentially. Mm. There's there's really good research in the adult sleep literature showing that when individuals are sleep-deprived in various ways, the functioning of their prefrontal cortex um, is really affected, and, and that can make you more impulsive, it can make you more negative, more reactive, and I think that's probably the process by which sleep would contribute to parenting. Okay. So if your brain isn't functioning at, at as high of a level, then you're unable to manage challenging child behavior in as effective as ways. Okay. Yeah. So you talk uh, in the introduction of your article about uh, the difference between positive parenting behaviors like warmth and responsiveness mm-hmm. versus negative parenting behaviors like overreactivity or harsh parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, what you're talking about, I think, is if a, a child, let's say a toddler, falls down and knocks over, who knows, a bowl of milk onto your important papers. Right. And then how the parent responds to something that doesn't seem to be intentional it's more accidental so can you paint that picture for us like what would be what would be a response that someone who was well rested could offer in that situation versus how you might respond if you were at your wits end because you were really exhausted right right so as you can probably imagine if you were exhausted and stressed you might overreact to that child's behavior Mm -hmm. so you might say how could you do that? And maybe lash out at the child um, and maybe have a verbal argument with the child. And later you might regret it. You might be like, oh, I did there. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have scolded him. I shouldn't have punished him. It was just a mistake. And that sort of rationalization might not be possible if you're highly impulsive due to sleep deficits. Um, if you were well rested, you might respond in a warmer way still being firm with the child and trying to, you know, teach principles of being careful and that sort of thing, but, but not overreacting. Yeah. The likelihood of overreacting, I believe is higher when sleep deprived. Okay. And so your article also talks about the connection between not be, not getting enough sleep and stress. So can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about cortisol levels and things that happen on a more biochemical level when yeah. you haven't gotten enough rest. Yeah, so that's there's a big area of research looking at the connection between stress and sleep deficits. And it's really fascinating to me. Um, this isn't necessarily a, a body of literature that involves parents, but just adults in general. Um, looking at what we call bi-directional links. Stress, that can impede your ability to fall asleep and get good restful sleep. Mm. I'm sure all of us have experienced times where you're stressed about something, so you're tossing and turning, unable to fall asleep, unable to maintain sleep. So stress can contribute to sleep problems, but then sleep problems themselves can act as a a source of stress on the body um, because it does affect the way that cortisol is processed over the course of the day. So individuals who are more sleep deprived end up with higher cortisol levels by the end of the day. There's other research that's a little bit out of my area, but has shown that and I've reviewed in that paper. Um, Another reason why sleep deficits are sort of a stressor to the body is they can affect, like I was mentioning before, they affect the functioning of the prefrontal cortex, and it can result in a higher level of negative reactivity. So you might perceive stressors as more stressful Uh. than you're sleep deprived. Right. And there's actually some really interesting research um, where they had people face different challenging situations when they were well rested versus when they were not as well rested. And they perceived those challenges as more challenging on days when they were sleep deprived. Um, They've done that research with like physical exercise and with various work tasks as well. 
So there's really interesting research on the connections between stress and sleep. So now are there, because it seems like you're talking about like these vicious circles where yeah. if you're stressed, then it makes it harder to sleep. And then because of, you're not able to get sleep, you're stressed about the fact that you can't sleep. Like right. I've had experiences where I go to bed and there's something on my mind and I can't shut my brain off. Mm -hmm. And then the next day I'm a basket case. And then at night I go to bed thinking, okay, it's really important that I get to sleep and I'm worried about not being able to get to sleep and that makes it hard to get to sleep. It, that's exactly right. Yeah, we we definitely think of sleep deficits as part of that vicious cycle, just like you're describing. And interestingly, I, um, I'm a researcher, but I also am a clinician. So I've, I've gotten through my training, I've done quite a bit of therapy with individuals. And one of the clinics that I worked in was actually um, a clinic for adults with insomnia. Mm. And we would deal with that exact issue of times where you're you know, your, your own cognitions, your own thoughts are starting to interfere with your sleep. So if you're thinking to yourself, I have to go to sleep, I need right. to do well tomorrow. Um, in that clinic where we did CBT for insomnia with adults, um, we worked on, you know, how do we reframe those thoughts so that you're feeling less pressured to get sleep? So t how do you reframe those thoughts? So um, in that, in that clinic, you know, CBT for insomnia, it's cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It's um, very evidence-based and it's manualized. So you, you follow, you know, a certain, certain order of intervention steps. And so there's a few things you would do first before you start working on reframing those thoughts. So okay. first you'd want to make sure you have really good sleep hygiene, good sleep schedule, um, do some of these behavioral things first, mm -hmm. um, seems to be pretty important. And then start working on some cognitive things in addition to some other things too, like maybe some relaxation exercises. Um, but the cognitive things, it can be for some people, it can be a little bit challenging to think about your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, some people do that very easily. They're readily able to share what their thoughts are around sleep. Mm -hmm. Others, they're like, wait, what? I, I, they just don't think that much about their thoughts. But the first step is identifying your thoughts. So trying to think, okay, last night when I was falling to sleep, what was running through my mind? What was I thinking about? Yeah. So first identifying the thoughts, then starting to evaluate the evidence for and against those thoughts. Come up with, after doing that evaluation of the evidence, trying to come up with a more adaptive thought. Mm -hmm. So not trying to sugarcoat or um, have rose-colored glasses about sleep, but try to have a more adaptive thought. So a more concrete example would be if you, if you were thinking at night like, if I don't get enough sleep tonight, my day tomorrow will be ruined. Uh -huh. That could make you feel very pressured to fall asleep. And it could be an, a maladaptive thought to really ruminate on. Yeah. A more adaptive thought or the process to get to a more adaptive thought might be evaluating evidence for and against. So could you come up with an example of a time where, yes, you didn't get enough sleep, but you were still able to get by. Okay, right. You were still able to go to work. Yeah. That process might be helpful. You know, there's a, a – it's going to make me sound like kind of a hippie, but uh, there's a guy, his name is Krishnamurti. He was like a Hindu philosopher back in the 70s. And uh, he had a couple things that have influenced my life, and one of them – seems to be related. He had this whole bit where he would talk about how the majority of things that stress us out and get us upset are things that haven't actually happened. They're just these, like you're expecting something to happen or you're making a prediction. Well, if this happens, then this is going to be the result. But when you like step back from it, that result hasn't occurred. That's just your brain creating a worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's funny that as a researcher, when I ask you a research question, you've got a lot to say. But then as soon as I start talking about it, <laughs> you're like, oh, OK, well, whatever, dude. <laughs> um, so, OK, so we're talking about stress and we're talking about parenting uh, and or sleep and and stress. And I was thinking to myself that there are all sorts of other things that you mention in your article that can add on to the stress. Like, for example, 
not having a job or being a single parent. So can you talk about how these can create just layers of stress that make things even more difficult? Oh, yeah, that's that's a great question. So in this paper, um, we used what we called a cumulative risk index of stress. So we basically recognize, just like you were mentioning, that stressors, forms of stress often converge. So it's not like you just experience one form of stress and that's it. It occurs in isolation. They usually compile and confound each other. So, um, for example, if you were a single parent, um, perhaps you also have limited economic resources. So mm-hmm. there's the stress of financial burden, financial right. strain. Yeah. Um, there can also be, you know, stressful life events. So maybe you just experienced a move or a change in job or a change in relationship or an illness or death in the family. Um, there can be just the daily stressors of being a parent, you know, having to do errands and cleaning and managing sibling conflicts. So there's a lot of forms of stress. And in this paper, we really wanted to look at them collectively because there's there's good research to show that um, if you look at stress in aggregate, you know, a combination of stressors, that's a much more powerful predictor of behavior than if you were to just look at one stressor. And in it's isolation. more realistic, too. You know, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's I, I have a friend, his name is George, and his wife went out of the country for a little bit. And he and I were talking about he had no real idea that uh when the kids were out of school that pretty much on a daily basis there was about three hours of driving that his mm-hmm. wife was having to do that he had to pick up. So all of a sudden, this one comes home. Okay, let's go to the swim practice. Then he's got to go back and get the other one, and take him to play practice. Then he's got to pick the first one up and take him to the tutoring session. And all of a sudden, it's nighttime. And uh, so I, I can't imagine as somebody who's in a marriage where we share the burden how to get it all done if it's just one person and there are plenty of people out there who are doing it, but it's got to be highly stressful to have to do all of it yourself. Right. Right. And I love that you brought up in that example, the the question about commute time, because, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in trying to get as much information as possible on lots of forms of stress that someone could face. And in our, in our study, we actually have the families complete what we call a daily schedule questionnaire. And we do ask about that sort of thing. We ask, you know, do, do you work outside of the home? How much do you work outside of the home? Do you take your child to daycare or school? Um, because these are toddlers, so they, they might not be going anywhere. Um, and then how long the commute is, you know, from, from daycare to work and from home to daycare. And, and how stressful that commute is, you know, how pressured does the parent feel to get out the door? And I think, I think that's really important to consider um, as another form of stress, especially when you're thinking about sleep and how how can you make time for sleep when you have all these other pressures? Um, it's that that question about commute. I haven't I haven't looked at too much in our data, but I know that we have information on that. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's just one thing after another. So if if we have a parent, let's create a hypothetical parent out there who's listening to this conversation, and you were going to give let let's start with a parent who has a partner in the home with him or her, what advice might you give them to try to keep the stress monsters at bay so that they have the emotional reserves to handle parenting with positive strategies? Right, right. Um, I think there's a couple different things I would say. Um, what, what's neat about this paper is that we found that sleep is associated with parenting above and beyond other forms of stress. Uh-huh. So we know that stress can affect parenting, but sleep also affects parenting. And why that's exciting to me is that sleep, there's actually something you could do about it. Yeah. So it's very hard if, if I were to give advice to the parent and say, well, just be less stressed. Right. You know, it's very hard <laughs> to change your life and yeah. be less stressed. But changing your sleep is still hard, but somewhat more attainable. Um, perhaps through some information about the importance of sleep and why sleep should be a priority, that might help. In addition to 
um, working on some sleep hygiene and some sleep scheduling to help the parent get better sleep. Um, there's sort of two main recommendations I would have. One is, um, obviously, parent sleep is associated with their child's sleep. So if you can get your child to bed successfully and they can stay asleep, then that will make it easier for the parent to kind of wrap up their evening and get to sleep themselves without being disrupted in the night or uh, waking up early in the morning. Um, so that's advice one is hopefully to get your child to sleep. And we have some strategies for that. Okay. And then my second piece of advice is for parents to not write sleep off. I think sometimes parents have so many demands on their time that they maybe let sleep take a back burner role. Right. Um, when really, if you think about it, you can be a more effective parent if you're able to rest. Yeah. And so putting a little more priority on sleep can help. And another thing I'd also emphasize, um, in this paper, the way we measured sleep was with actographs. So we had the parents wear an actograph on their wrist for at least a week. Okay. Like a Fitbit. Yeah. And it records minute to minute motor activity. And from that, we're able to extract when the parent is sleeping. Right. And we didn't just look at how long the parent was sleeping. We also looked at how variable their sleep was from night to night and how late they were going to bed, ah. um, among other variables. But those three, I think, are really important. And sometimes we only talk about how much sleep are you getting, so just duration. Yeah. But I think there's actually quite a bit of research to show for parents and for children that variability really matters and timing really matters. So that would be another piece of advice that I would give a parent is try to get on a consistent sleep schedule. Because variability can have a detrimental effect on both the parent and the child. Mm -hmm. um, and then also trying to get to bed earlier, that will help with um, reaching a better sleep duration too. So there are two things that come to mind in my work with parents that I think might be related to this putting sleep on the back burner. And I'd be curious mm -hmm. to know if you had thoughts about either or both of them. And one is, I guess, this idea that the parent is supposed to sacrifice him or herself whenever possible. And so if I have to be tired, that's just, that's just part of being a parent. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. um, so that maybe like a guilt factor about sleep being selfish or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that question. Um, I actually, some of my other clinical work is in a clinic, um, for parents whose children have high levels of behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the first units we cover is on parental well-being. So, so how can the parent make sure that they're taking care of themselves and they're the best version of themselves for their child? And a lot of parents have that reaction of like, isn't it selfish of me? Like, how can I even think about my own well-being when I just need to be providing for my child? Right. And it might be a little bit counterintuitive, but you know, the, the metaphor I like to use is, um, you know, on an airplane when they say to put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then on, on your child or on the person next to you. Uh -huh. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a good reference because, you know, you really cannot provide for your child at as high of a level if you're really struggling, if that's you're great. running on E. It's, it's very hard to be your best self and, and provide adequately for your child. Um, so doing some of that personal investment, making sure that you're living as balanced a life as possible and getting some rest, even if it's counterintuitive, I think is, is very important. Well, and I think, so that's, first of all, that's a great analogy. Um, second of all, it calls to mind an old 80s song called Running on Empty. So I'm going to have to like figure out where to find that. Um, yeah. and, uh, and third of all, if the reason that you're sacrificing your own sleep is because you feel like you have to be giving to your children, it sounds like a pretty good argument for getting sleep that if you're well rested, you're going to be a better parent. Right. Right. Um, so now we've talked about, we've talked on the one side about the people who are sacrificing their sleep because of the you know, uh, sacrificial model that they might have about what their role is. Mm -hmm. What about the other side? What about parents who, 
you know, maybe they didn't realize how it was going to change their lives to actually have this young being roaming around their house. Is it possible that sometimes people are resistant to the sacrifice and so they're not getting that that there's some kind of resentment toward the child or there's some kind of separation between in the role of parent because the child is taking away some of the time that they used to spend partying, hanging out with friends, things like that. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I really like that question. I I think it's um I I think in a very developmental way. And sometimes when we talk about development, we're just focusing on kids. But if you take a lifespan developmental perspective, you know, parents are developing too. And there's certainly an adjustment around the transition to parenting and what that role looks like and what the expectations are. And I think even, you know, even if parents are hesitant to talk about it, I think there is definitely sometimes a sense of like, oh gosh, like this is harder than I thought and, and some resentment, especially if, if you're raising a difficult child. Mm. I mean, like I mentioned, I work in a clinic of children with high levels of behavior problems. And I think sometimes, although it can be challenging for parents to talk about and be open about, sometimes there are those feelings of like, you know, this kid is really challenging and this, you know, this isn't fun. This isn't what I expected. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that can be sort of like you mentioned, sort of the other side of the coin. And, um, I think having those open conversations about those thoughts and normalizing them, you know, mm. recognizing like, yeah, a lot of parents have those thoughts and then thinking again about, you know, how could we reframe this in a more adaptive way? Yeah. Oh, so reframing seems to be a real key here uh, to this whole picture. I'm going to have to reflect on that a little bit later when I start to write. Um, I, as you know, there's going to be an article about this topic. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be citing your work among others. And uh, right. the idea of reframing some of the thoughts that we have around what it means to be a parent, what my obligations are as a parent, Mm -hmm. how much I'm allowed to be taking care of myself mm -hmm. as part of the process of being better with my children. Um, that seems like a real important key word that keeps coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let, let's just put it in a nutshell. I want to kind of wrap up the conversation, but I want to give people who are listening some real concrete, I know that you've already done that. You talked about sleep hygiene and consistency, but let's just reiterate, you know, like let's say the top three things that a person can do to try to get more sleep and take care of themselves so that they're better parents in the long run. And I want to keep in mind that there are some parents out there who can't just ask their husband or ask their partner take the kid for a drive while I take a nap. So what do we right. do in that situation? Yeah, of course. I love that question. I've, I've really valued the work that I've done with, with single parents. And I think they're an understudied group. And I think that um, making sure that our advice uh, works for them as well is very, very important. So if I were to give kind of three take home messages or three, home, three pieces of advice, um, one would be consistent sleep schedules. So a lot of people try to maybe stay up late during the week to catch up on work. And then on the weekend, maybe they're catching up on sleep. But research has shown that it actually works a lot better if you can keep a consistent sleep schedule across the week. Okay. So, you know, for parents out there trying to, you know, Obviously, bedtimes can vary from night to night, but maybe trying to keep that variation to no more than an hour from night to night. You're talking about I the think. child and the parent. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's very important. And then um, in addition to consistent sleep schedules, that's for bedtime and for wake time. So hmm. if you sleep way in on the weekend and try to catch up on sleep, that can then, of course, mess you up for the next night. So if you sleep till 10 a.m. on Sunday... And then Sunday night, you try to go to bed early, you might not be as tired because there's less sleep pressure that has built over the day. Yeah. So consistent sleep schedules in both wake time and uh, bedtime. And then another piece of advice that I bet a lot of people out there have already heard, 
But when it comes to good sleep hygiene, really getting electronic screens out of the bedtime routine for the parent and the child Mm -hmm. is important. And that's easier said than done because many people have that as part of their, you know, they're accustomed to falling asleep, maybe watching TV or looking at their phone. But the blue light emitted from those electronic screens is really disruptive to sleep. Mm. Um, So maybe replacing it, you know, with, with children, I often recommend like maybe instead of TV time, maybe have them read a book or like read a book to them or even listening to an audio book. Um, those could be good replacements for the electronic screens. That can create, then, I would think that could create some kind of like classical conditioning too, where the child <laughs> comes to associate the reading of the book with bedtime. Maybe it right. can create, uh, the body starts to like calm itself down because right. this pr- particular right. routine exactly. uh, means yep. going to bed. Yes. Yeah. So establishing a consistent routine with, with steps that help, um, the family as a whole feel secure and calm for bed, I think is really helpful. Hmm. And if a parent is working on that with their child, you know, investing in a good bedtime routine for their child and, and establishing a consistent bedtime for their child, that could translate to a consistent bedtime for the parent, yeah. um, improving the family at large, I believe. Right. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately for some people who want to still be in college and have children at the same time. I mean, in terms of their mindset, like all the fun things that they want to do happen after 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And Mm -hmm. those are just going to have to be set along the wayside for a while, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or even like, you know, it's, I'm big on living a balanced life. So if there's certain, you know, a fun thing that's important to the person, maybe planning that ahead of time and saying, okay, I want to make sure that I'm able to do this once a month or something like that. But right. but you're still prioritizing the basics mm-hmm. of your sleep and your child's sleep. Um, I think, I think that's pretty important. Yeah. And if you're having trouble sleeping, how do you feel about just drinking large amounts of alcohol or doing large amounts of drugs to help you drift off into the night? Would that be something that you would advocate? <laughs> that's that's an excellent question. So whenever I, I mention that phrase, sleep hygiene, yeah. there's a few pieces of um, advice that kind of are grouped in that category of sleep hygiene. So one of them being electronic screens, but another one is substances. And the two main substances that I often talk about, one is alcohol, the other is caffeine. So Uh sometimes people think that alcohol can help them fall asleep. Like, oh, this, this will make me drowsy. But research has actually shown that it's associated with poor maintenance. You actually have less restful, less deep sleep um, when alcohol is involved in the mix. So, so that would not be my advice there. And then also kind of on the related note about, um, caffeine intake, certainly for children, you know, a caffeine intake is, is really problematic. Um, but for adults, generally I'd recommend avoiding caffeine intake in the afternoons and evenings, because if you've consumed caffeine, that can really mess with your ability to fall asleep that night. Right. Great. Great. Well, I appreciate the conversation. I I know for myself that when I get a really good night's sleep, that the rest of my day is a lot easier. And I also know that when I haven't slept well, that generally I'm more easily set off and it takes a little bit more energy to try to be a nice person and keep my head about me. Um, exactly. So, you know, this idea of thinking about sleep metacognitively is, you know, a really important one. And I'm glad there are people out there like you who are calling attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good luck on defending your dissertation. I imagine uh, maybe this gave you a little bit of practice. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I know any, any opportunity to talk about my research and how it relates to parents. I, I really appreciate the opportunity and I think you're doing great work. Thank you. Well, Um, If anyone wanted to get in touch with you or or learn more about the work that you're doing or or the clinic, is there a place where they could go um, to learn more about it? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a couple options. They could either email me directly or they're welcome to visit our lab website. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the interview, I work with Dr. Jack Bates Mm -hmm. and he has a website website. 
It's called the Bates Social Development Lab at Indiana University. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact website name, but if you were to look that up, that gives a nice summary of our ongoing research projects. And then there's also another website that that perhaps you could link later, John, um, that has a summary of our sleep intervention that we offer to parents. Ah. Um, And there's a nice website where it kind of gives an overview of what the intervention involves. And there's actually little videos that families can watch about how to improve their child's sleep habits. And um, those videos are available via that website. All right, great. Well, later you can send me that link and I'll certainly put that in the uh, information section about the show. Great. And go Hoosiers. When, when are they going to have yes. a championship basketball team again? I know. Yeah. I know. I, I'm a big IU basketball fan, yeah. and so is Dr. Bates. And, you know, I had my, my hopes up for this year that they'd make the tournament, and it just just didn't happen. So it's kind of sad, but go Hoosiers indeed. Eventually, eventually that Romeo kid looks like he's pretty good. and Yeah. But I remember that championship team under uh, Gene Hackman. That was uh, mm-hmm. They were a good team, too. That's, yeah, that's a joke, obviously, since that's fictional. But <laughs> we always have that to watch. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks again for your time, and thank you, listener, for tuning in. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to be on next week yet, but uh, I'm looking into a couple pretty uh, high-profile opportunities, and I'll be putting something on my site when I lock one of them in. Anyway, happy parenting, and get some good rest. Talk to you next time. Ah, living in a city when you're in it, watch the people walk by. And if you listen real close, you can hear them talk about their lives. And some hate it, some love it, some of the thoughts, some are just tired. These are the people in the neighborhood, they just trying to make it out right. See, she never wanted to be in the... IPMNation.com 